Hi, everyone. My name is Jacques Lavey. I'm an architect with the firm D. Stanley Dixon Architects in Atlanta, Georgia. I developed this course to provide an introduction into the Grecian language that swept the country in the early 19th century and has been providing inspiration in both form and detail really ever since. I'm from Southeast Louisiana originally, and I became interested in its early, more Creole architecture and how it made the transition to a classical, specifically Grecian language. That led me to focus in on the Grecian movement in graduate school, and luckily I've been able to use the language in professional practice since then. With that, I would like to share some of the things that I found personally interesting and those that I found useful in practice. I hope that this course provides for a greater understanding of the Grecian movement so that you can better point out its characteristics and perhaps use the language in your own work. So from here, I'd like to start the slides with a list of objectives that I have for the course. These are to understand the basics of the development of the Grecian movement in the United States, to become familiar with the various modes of transmission that allowed the Grecian movement to be prevalent across the country, to understand how historic precedent was utilized and adapted during this movement for new uses and to further develop existing traditions and building types, to gain an understanding of useful precedent in both forms and details that can be utilized and adapted in new designs today, to learn about regional variations and how Grecian architecture altered vernacular forms, and lastly, to be familiar with historical and modern resources to utilize as design references and further research. Those are a number of specifics, but overall, I hope this demonstrates that the Grecian movement is a great example of the adaptability and the usefulness of the classical language for it to continuously evolve and adapt to its purpose and place. And that by studying the Grecian movement, you can greatly add to your toolkit for designing today. Before we get into things, I wanted to discuss a way of thinking about types of architecture that is useful to consider when referencing historical precedent. Stephen Sims did a fantastic lecture on this, which I encourage everyone to listen to. Just Google Stephen Sims built environments and you'll find it. He describes that most schools of thought place an emphasis on time-based architecture. In the time-based approach, designers speak of an architecture of our time and historians speak of historic structures as documents of their time. A concept that leads to an assumption that the development of architectural character is linear, with sequence periods and styles, a timeline that is understood to be irreversible, continuing forever into the future, and the use of historic forms as working against that timeline. This approach can affect what we choose to preserve, often giving preference to great examples of a specific period and not to other structures that can have other significant features architecturally or to a community, especially non-elite communities. This approach can also affect what we choose to build today, especially in historic areas, asking for new buildings or additions to read more from our time than of the past, differentiating it in character from nearby historic fabric. Or, on the other extreme, if someone chooses to design in a so-called historical style, they may be compelled to fully epitomize the style rather than expand it. On the other hand, there are those, like most of my fellow classicists, that like to give greater primacy to place in our design thinking by regarding the local historic architectural character as something not just of the past, but a character of a place that can be utilized and built upon not simply copied, but used as precedent and adapted to be solutions to current architectural design problems, all while still retaining a harmonious architectural identity. The propagation of a style or character can operate within its own logic across both time and place. An architectural character might become dominant at some point in time, fade away, and then reappear at a later point creating a spectrum of architecture that does not easily fall into discrete categories. And as Sims puts it, 
while the architectural identities of regions and communities will indeed change over time, time does not determine that identity. While I hope to show you that the Grecian movement is a broad and useful topic to study, I also hope that you will see how it is a great example of place-based architecture, using the adaptability of the classical language to both reinforce and expand the existing character and building culture of a place. Once we get through some background um, and some fun details, we'll briefly pull it all together, showing a few examples of what I'm referring to and how 19th century designers adapted existing traditions using the Grecian language. Okay, now on to some background. When referring to the Grecian movement in the States, we are referring to an artistic movement that became prominent in the first half of the 19th century that was inspired by details and forms from ancient Greece. It was a complete artistic movement, and it is now often considered a national architecture connecting places as culturally different as New Orleans and Boston, and buildings as different as a smokehouse and a state capitol. Overall, allowing for a homogenous national architectural language despite its numerous regional variations. These images uh, are to represent what I meant by a complete artistic movement, showing how it affected architecture, furniture, clothing, painting, and other decorative arts. The movement got its big kickstart with the publishing of the Antiquities of Athens by Stuart and Rivette in 1762. Thanks to the financial support of this group of gentlemen, the Society of Dilettanti, a London dining club, Stuart and Rivette were able to travel to Greece to produce a series of extremely detailed architectural drawings and perspective scenes. Before this time, Greece was pretty much locked up to Europeans, but with the ease of diplomatic relations, some travel was now allowed, providing access to these structures. With the publication of Antiquities of Athens, the Grecian language slowly entered into the European architectural vocabulary. And while the book was indeed available in the United States, it was a rare source in the country's early years. Nonetheless, the knowledge initially started to spread through other sources, such as British books by Peter Nicholson, that began to re-engrave key details such as this one from the Antiquities of Athens, making them more easily accessible to architects, particularly in America. An important note is that these new resources were becoming available at a key moment in our American history. America is growing rapidly and gaining significant wealth. Cities were growing at a fast rate, providing architectural opportunities at really every scale. Aside from architecture, there was a large interest in the classical. Our education system at this time was based on classical literature and knowledge. America was also looking forward to a new more modern architecture and away from its colonial past. It's one that would eventually change our built environment from buildings such as this Independence Hall to this, the second bank of the U.S. This can also be seen in the competition for the U.S. Capitol building, where proposals such as the two at the top, both with their own merits and complications, took inspiration from England's past compared to the design at the bottom with a more modern take on classicism. At first, this language would be expressed as Roman classicism, the classicism of Jefferson, such as seen at his UVA and the Capitol Building of Virginia. As these new classical traditions gain its footing for the country's buildings, particularly new civic commissions, the Grecian movement had an entry point into the American architectural story. There's a lot more to this, of course, but I'll keep it brief to get into the more technical side of how and what. Like I mentioned, access to the antiquities of Athens was hard to come by. Most of the spread of the Grecian language was thanks to more attainable pattern books, particularly those by Asher Benjamin and Menar Lefevre. Slowly, Grecian details entered into these readily available books more and more until both Asher and Menar's were pretty much entirely focused on Grecian-inspired work. By looking at the contents of the American pattern books themselves, you can see this transition. 
I grabbed some books from my personal collection to show this. Um, this is a copy of Asher Benjamin's first book, The Country Builder's Assistant, from the very late 1700s. It's the first architecture book written and published by an American. It mentions quirked moldings here, a Greek detail and subject taken from Peter Nicholson's books, but no direct reference or real discussion of Greek architecture. And you can see from the plates on the right, it's architecture that's typical of the late 1700s, pre-Greek classicism. Now here's my copy of the second American architecture book published almost a decade later in 1805. The orders in this book are still Roman based. There's no big discussion of the Grecian, but at the very back, a single plate shown on the right, showing Benjamin the Trobe's Bank of Pennsylvania, which we will see later, and the simple description stating it uses an Ionic order taken from an ancient Greek temple. Now, these are two separate editions of the American Builder's Companion by Asher Benjamin. I have these two editions just to show this transition. The earlier edition on the left, there's still no direct mention, but as these details and forms are becoming more and more popular, he made a change in his sixth edition, 1827, on the right. You can see here he proudly and boldly advertises and Grecian architecture, including seven new plates on the Greek Doric and Ionic for the first time in his books. After this, most of these pattern books focused almost entirely on Grecian details. The Modern Builder's Guide and Beauties of Modern Architecture, for example, are pages and pages of Grecian architecture that would help guide American architects and builders in their designs. So while what I mentioned before were a few reasons that allowed Grecian architecture to get its foot in the door, these books are one of the keys into why Grecian details can be found in just about every 19th century little town. They are why it was really able to flourish to the extent that it did, and also to such a high level of design. In these books, one would find the drawings of the Grecian orders, yes, but also creative ways to use Grecian details in a more contemporary setting. Here is just one of many examples for a front door, uh, lovingly called a frontispiece. You'll find window details, mantel details, molding profiles, ceiling medallions, um, all sorts of designs. Here is an example of a pocket door detail with a built version on the right, and in the same home, a smaller version the door taken from another plate. And here, one of my personal favorites, a really great version of a Corinthian capital that was originally constructed for the Grecian Corrigic Monument of the Cycrides. For an utterly simplified recap of this, we have the Corrigic Monument of the Cycrides in Athens, originally a monument dedicated to the championship of the local boys choir, represented here. Stuart and Rivette, with the backing of the Society of Dilettanti, recorded the monument as it stood in Athens in the mid-1700s. You can see it tucked in the back corner. Published its details in the Antiquities of Athens, which eventually made its way into American pattern books and used by architects and builders throughout the country. You can find details of this monument all over the U.S. or even in its entirety modified here to be part of the crowning element of the Tennessee State Capitol. Now, the Grecian movement wouldn't be all that exciting if the story was as simple as that. The copying of Greek forms and details straight through pattern books to our own Greek temple stateside. But when one starts studying the Grecian movement, you'll soon realize the degree of originality and the fluidity designers possessed during this time when utilizing the knowledge. Oftentimes, builders, yes, simply use details straight out of pattern books. But architects saw these details and forms as elements on how to improve their own design process, as a source of learning to add precedent to their expanding toolkit to solve modern design problems. The difference in creativity between architects and builders during this time may seem like an obvious statement today, 
but the role of the professional architect is just beginning to be established in the state compared to the apprentice builder, say. Quoting a 19th century architect, the popular idea that to design a building in Grecian taste is nothing more than to copy a Grecian building is altogether erroneous. Even the Greeks themselves never made two buildings alike. If architects would oftener think as the Greeks thought than do as the Greeks did, our columnar architecture would possess a higher degree of originality and its character and expression would gradually conform to the local circumstances of the country and the Republican spirit of its institutions. There's a key point in this on why Grecian architecture was so successful in the US. While the country had an opening both culturally and economically, and the pattern books were the means in spreading the information, the key point to me on why it really flourished is that the development of the professional architect in America coincided with the interest of current archeology span in Greece. By utilizing these new and beautiful details in creative, appropriate, and successful ways, they raised the level of their work and distinguished both themselves and the entire profession. To follow this thought, I would like to take a look at a number of elements that became popular with this movement to give a glimpse on how the professional architect utilized the Grecian precedent in creative ways. These are also some of the elements I have found useful in practice to reference for inspiration and can of course be emulated and furthered to help solve current design problems. The first, perhaps one of my favorite, uh, runs through all of the rest, and that's the Grecian moldings. Now, this is, is a big topic, so I'm just going to touch on it here. Before Stuart and Rivette made access to detailed drawings of ancient Greek details, moldings were pretty much entirely based off of Roman versions from treatises such as Vignola, Palladio. This tradition of moldings was based off of simple curves consisting of a single center point, a circle. So this capital, for instance, contains simple, easily constructed curves. Even a double curved profile, such as the uppermost profile, is broken down into two curves, each with their own singular center point, curves based on circles. Greek moldings, on the other hand, are elliptical or parabolic in form and require several, several radii to define it. So, for instance, if we have these, let's say, more Roman curves that form the capital that we just saw, an example of Grecian details would be more based on curves such as these. Now, this allows for lots of variation in the possibilities of a profile by altering these curves. These are just four random examples showing how this can be done. It allows the designer to adjust the profile for what the specific case calls for. Greek details also often employed quirked moldings where the curve of the profile turns back in on itself, providing both a strong highlight of light shining on it at the peak of the profile and a deep shadow in the recess. If we apply these ideas to a typical cornice profile, such as this one, that we can consider to be more Roman, we can alter the profiles to adjust the cornice, perhaps pulling it in this direction, adding a sense of strength, or shortening it, providing for a more elongated overall form. Here are just a few examples of cornice profiles from Benjamin, just to show some of the variety you can develop from these ideas. You can see the varying profiles, complex curves, quirks, all to provide a variety of shade and shadow that simple radius moldings cannot provide. Another big topic are the Greek orders that made their way into the pattern books. There are tons of variations, but I'll just point out a few basic details that will help you spot them. The Greek Doric, which you see on the right, compared to a version of the Roman Doric on the left, these are both plates from American pattern books, by the way, uh, show some of these differences. The Greek capital on the right, again, quite different and based on profiles types that we just discussed with a parabolic echinus versus the one on the left that's based on a simple circle. Greek Doric 
does not have a base, while the Roman version usually does. In antiquity, the Greek was nearly always fluted, where the Roman could be fluted or not can really go either way. Also, in the Roman model, if we look at the left, we see this molding called the astragal. Or if we compare it to the Grecian Doric on the right, it is replaced by this thin groove called the hypotrichalion. If we look at that photo again of fluted Greek Doric on the second bank of the US, we can see the capital, the parabolic economist, the lack of a base, and the groove below the neck. There are other differences and many variations of the Greek Doric. Let's move along to my personal favorite, the Greek Ionic. Again, I pulled two plates from American pattern books uh, just to show what they were seeing at that time. The Greek on the right, the more Roman model, Eskimozi version on the left. From these, we can see that the Greek Ionic is very large uh, volutes. Between them, you get this swag or dip connecting the volutes. This is another telltale sign for a Grecian model, where if we look at the left, you can see it's just a linear goes straight across between the volutes. And also, if we look closely, we'll see some of those molding profiles based on parabolas, and there'll be more in the entablature. This is an example from the North Carolina State House. And you can see the large volutes, the swag or dip connecting them, and complex molding profiles. The Corinthian order in the American Grecian movement are somewhat more unique. On the right, we have that Corrigic monument of Socrates version that we've seen previously. It's a very lively design. If you compare the canthus leaves, you see that on the right, the Greek version, it has only one row of the canthus leaves, those little flowers peeking out, which is a great detail. On the left, in the Roman version, there's two rows of acanthus leaves. If we look at that mold, again, this is kind of similar to the Doric. On the left, Roman version, we have an astragal. And on the right, Greek version, we have that thin groove at the base of the capital. And this is probably my favorite detail on this. The flutes on the shaft of the column at the very top flare out like leaves, terminating the shafts in a rather, rather elegant way. Here is a residential example um, where you can see the single row of the canthus leaves, the groove at the base of the capital, and the flutes terminating as leaves towards the top of the shaft. My favorite example of this is a civic version in the New Orleans Customs House. Uh, this is the Marble Hall, which is unfortunately very rarely seen. If we zoom into the capitals, and you see how they're wonderfully carved with lots of great detail, with symbols of trade incorporated into them. The Tower of the Winds Capital is another version of a Corinthian that we can give thanks to Stuart and Rivette for recording. You can find this in a number of places. It's quite common, um, still fairly popular uh, today as well. This is a polychromatic version in the Mississippi State House. In the American pattern books, you will also find new orders created by the authors with various degrees of originality. This is one by Benjamin that he referred to as a new order in the Greek manner for American use. His column proportions are taller than normal, the cornice is flatter with greater projection, an original entablature that is somewhat ionic, and a column with a Greek Doric capital but in this case with a base, with a single torus. Menard developed this modified ionic order with a more delicate and enriched capital. In his words, with perhaps a little false modesty, he states that it has neither the proportions nor general features of the antique ionic order, nor is it pretended it is in general equal to it, but it is hoped that it may not be wholly inferior. Lastly, a form of a Corinthian that Menard claims ownership over and describes that it is a design composed of antique specimens. This capital is fairly common and it's a direct cue to the use of the Fever's books in the design. Now, jumping to the scale 
of full buildings. Let's take a broad view to look at overall building forms. While you may initially think these would simply be Greek temples, you will find a huge array of new and creative building forms being developed during this period, still referencing precedent, but meeting new uses or old programs in new ways. Here is the Astro Library by A.J. Davis. To me, it's a very creative elevation with the central door, the glass screens and filling the columns, and particularly like the books in the pediment. This is a little arsenal in New Orleans by Dakin, a great example of a strong civic facade built into the urban fabric. A proposed university building on the left and the New York Exchange on the right. This is the Astor Hotel in New York by Davis. The Ohio State Capitol Building. The Philadelphia Exchange, utilizing the Courageous Monument as inspiration at a number of scales on the same building. The Tremont House. The first large scale building to be constructed as a hotel with an extremely influential plan and design that impacted a number of other hotels across the country, such as the St. Charles Hotel in New Orleans. This was the largest hotel in the country when it was built. Architects, like those who designed these buildings, definitely used the pattern books freely for smaller commissions, but for more important works, departure from any exact copying of Greek forms and details was the rule rather than the exception using the details creatively and altering as needed to suit the program and design challenges. This hotel also brings us into the use of the dome, which is just one example of combining Greek and Roman forms. Here's another example, yet another Astor Hotel, with its dome, great lanterns, and its free use of water is at multiple scales. Again, the Ohio State, State House, with its interior dome expressed in a more cylindrical form. The North Carolina State Capitol building, which if you ever have a chance to visit, uh, definitely go inside. It's, it's a sight to see. The Trobes Bank of Pennsylvania, with its low dome barely peeking out, basically an interior experience. The Bank of Louisville, with its elliptical dome, not expressed on the outside at all, solely an interior moment in this case. And the New York City Customs House, with the dome similarly designed as mostly an interior space. It's actually even lower in the built work. Um, many of you have probably visited. Now, if we look at the side of this building, we'll see another element that I would like to highlight, and that's the use of the Greek anta. Here, they are pilaster-like elements marching down with thin capitals adapted from the original Greek version. Going back to Stuart and Vest drawings to look at a ancient Greek version, we see the elevation of these two ante. You can see how their capitals differ from the freestanding columns. Now, if we look in plan, you can see that they're just slightly projecting piers, terminating the walls. They're not engaged pilasters or freestanding columns. You can see the detail on the right of the capital. So in this example, with the profile on the right, of particular note is how this so-called beak mold returns up with the recess, creating a very deep and sharp shadow line underneath the capital. To me, this is one of the more useful details to use in practice, whether on capitals like this, in cornices, or really any other detail. Now, as I mentioned, the ante were more typically these slightly projecting piers at the end of a wall. During this period, the ante took on a broader role, with the ante molding serving as capitals of both engaged and freestanding pilasters. So going back to the customs house we see here, you can see that the projection of the ante is much greater than that of traditional engaged pilasters. It emulates the powerful depth and the deep shadows of colonnade with freestanding columns greatly emphasizing the rhythmical character and the strong order that this building has. A.J. Davis employed this feature quite readily. Here's another example in Philadelphia. Back to the Ohio State Capitol. Note again the difference with a typical pilaster. 
the capitals of the pilaster would normally match that of the column. And you can see that strong, crisp shadow line on the ANSA capital produced by that molding profile. That great little arsenal in New Orleans with extremely deep pilasters and the windows that fill the entire area in between them, spanning floors similarly to that A.J. Davis library we saw, and the close-up of the capital on the left showing the recess that creates that strong shadow line. Some of the renderings that we saw using both the depth of the pilaster and the glass to accentuate the anti-pilasters as almost freestanding. This is A.J. Davis's cross-block terrace development with a lot of strength provided by both the freestanding and the engaged ante. Similar concept to his Astor Hotel design. And lastly for this, this little courthouse, which I think is a lot of fun in Virginia, with the ante capitals marching around. So this building brings us to a facade type that you can find in most every 19th century city and small town, the diastyle in Antis, with these two freestanding columns at the entry, flanked on either side by pilasters. And I really mean these are everywhere. Here's one in Richmond, Savannah, using the Corinthian order, a very powerful dork in Alabama, and three blocks down the street is another using the Greek Ionic. And in New York City, the Mariner's Temple. Another elevation tool utilizing the Greek Anta is what we'll call the granite pier buildings. The Anta in this type are only at the first level, deep reveals and filled with doors or windows. They're often mixed use with the granite piers serving as the screen for the shops below. These are very common in New Orleans, Philadelphia, they're along Stone Street in New York. They're a great way to bring a smaller scale to the street, flexibility for the shop fronts, and provide a very ordered, rhythmic sidewalk. For those who are not familiar with New Orleans, these are the Pentalpo apartments that form the upriver and downriver border of Jackson Square. To me, it's one of the best public spaces in the country. Um, typical of New Orleans, the building, which has those antipilasters as the base, is further layered with an ironwork, ironwork gallery, which creatively adapts classical columns, elongating them drastically with a thin entablature to match the characteristics of the metal compared to the proportions used in stone for the antipilasters. You won't find these proportions specified in any pattern books, but it's a logic that is somewhat innate to the classical tradition. Now, one of my favorite elements that was used extensively is the raking or stepped blocking horse or parapet. So what I'm looking at here is this triangular portion above the entablature, which would traditionally be a full pediment. Here, it is a much flatter element that sits on top of the cornice, peaking towards the center, providing emphasis similar to a pediment. Now, this is an extreme example. A more typical one can be seen here on this great little shotgun. So this is a stepping parapet. Highlight that there. And you can also, on this one, see some Italianate detailing coming into play with the brackets and such. Lots of variation go into their scale, where they step, if they peek towards the center. Here are some examples on larger homes, the left in South Carolina, the right in Indiana, with decorative acroteria at the corners and other scroll elements. You can also find this on interior elements, such as doors and fireplaces. Uh, this here is an example by Asher Benjamin. The Bank of Louisville, where the upper cornice somewhat turns into this element at the center with that old anthemion. To me, this is one of the most creative buildings. It's by James Dakin, who worked for and with A.J. Davis. It has the Greek Ionic capitals that we mentioned uh, that were modified from the original Grecian versions, sitting in Ansys between these unmolded masonry piers that are battered with a little Egyptian influence, giving the building emphasis as well as a solution to how the cornice returns without overlapping the neighboring buildings. 
and perhaps my favorite example of this, this little granite portal with the central step and simple molds alongside a townhouse in New Orleans. The last specific element I like to mention, which you have seen many times now, is the use of the endymion. These are examples from the pattern books. Basically, they're a design element consisting of a series of radiating petals that was developed by the Greeks and recorded by Stuart and Rivet. On the left is a single palmette version, and on the right is an example of an alternating palmette and lotus motif, which is pretty common. To demonstrate a few examples of its use, I'm going to use a South Carolina interior at Milford, which has details that are very heavily inspired by Menard's beauties of modern architecture. So just in this view alone, we have the Anthemian motif in the Craig Monument capitals, and the Anti capitals on the side with that alternating pattern, on the panels of the window surround, a stylized version on the furniture, in the ceiling medallion, cresting the top of the windows and the door entablatures, in the newer but appropriate carpet, on the fireplace mantle, and dotting the top of the cornice surrounding the entire room. If we zoom in to the door surround, we can see that its inspiration came from plate 19, with that alternating pattern running across the top of the surround. And with a fanciful endymion rising up at the center and peeking up at the edges, serving as acroteria for the door. Looking at the ceiling medallion, it's inspired by plate 21. This is actually one of my favorite elements in the book. I think it's one of Menard's more successful details. Now that we've gone through some various elements, I would like to take a look at how this language affected the existing vernacular of a region. To do so, surprise, surprise, I've chosen one I'm quite familiar with, being from the area, but also one that differs from most of the country. Louisiana's colonial history varies greatly from most of the United States, with its French, Spanish, African, German, and many other influences. It can often be more accurately understood in its early history as a Caribbean city versus an American city. With that, its earliest architecture is quite unique. You see the homes are raised on piers, thin columns on the main level. It's very similar to a lot of things that are going on throughout the Caribbean. These are two more urban examples in the French Quarter to give you a sense of the city's early character. Now, even with such a strong vernacular tradition, when the Grecian wave hit, New Orleans truly became a Grecian city, and its architecture changed dramatically. This is Gallier Hall, the City Hall, the New Orleans Mint, the Arsenal, a couple of townhouses, a large home in the Garden District, and a personal favorite. Now, this home is along St. Charles Avenue. It's now part of a school. And a couple of urban Creole cottages with their Grecian doorways. Even with this great shift, it still maintained a character that is unique to Louisiana. There are many homes like this one that could have been updated with Grecian doorways or also built as is. It's honestly very hard to tell. Here's another example, basically an earlier form, except for its doors around. And if that wasn't cribbing enough, this home in the Marigny with this Greek detailing. Updates to existing structures is definitely one way this occurred. A large transformation can be seen at Evergreen, shown below, where it originally had an earlier, more traditionally Creole appearance, like the home above. That type of transformation over time can be seen here at Destrehan, where it's slowly adapted to eventually take on its current appearance. To me, the more interesting examples that express the idea of architecture adapting to a new language are those that are designed as such, forms that are built as is and not renovated. This is Bocage, and to me, it's one of the better examples of traditions changing over time showing the adaptability of the classical language. On the left is Madame John's legacy. It's a home in the quarter 
that is a great example of a character that would have been popular during Louisiana's colonial period. It's thin columns raised up on a lower level in the plan below with rooms flowing into rooms, a Creole plan without halls, a gallery across the front and in the rear, a central porch, a very typical element in Louisiana called a cabinet gallery with two little rooms on either side, the cabinets. On the right, Bocage, it's a wildly different architectural treatment, but very similar in overall form and plan, be it at a larger scale. It's raised on a raised de chose with the front gallery, the Creole hall-less plan with the rear cabinet gallery. However, in Bocage, the two central rooms are treated very similarly to a typical American double parlor. Here's a view of them here. And if you didn't know any better, this could easily be a side hall townhouse in the Northeast. Now, let's break this down a little. We mentioned how H.A. Davis extensively used the Greek anta in his designs, such as at the side of the New York City Customs House. Again, seen here, highlighting the entrance by emphasizing the center with two in Anta's columns and utilizing the stepped blocking course above. Davis's prodigy, James Dakin, eventually made it down to New Orleans, where he designed that little arsenal that I'm sure by now, if you've realized, I really love, with very deep ante and a strong stepped blocking course. When faced with the commission, Dakin was able to utilize his creativity to merge the traditions, providing an example that is recognizable and lives as a Louisiana poem, but in a more modern Grecian taste. You see the use of the Greek ante here elongated, the unique use of very slender ante emphasizing the center, somewhat like in Ante's columns, the steps and raking blocking course above, and many, many other details. And on the back side of Bocage, similarly, the use of in Ante's ante keep the tradition of the cabinet gallery similar to that on the home seen below. Now, if we look at Bocage on the right, these doors and the windows were added later, so you need to use your imagination to envision the open porch and compare it to the earlier home below. At a smaller scale, on the left, you see this small home that is one room wide and quite long. This thin, long form will eventually turn into what is now called a shotgun home, a form ubiquitous in New Orleans. On the right, a later shotgun that adapted this form, taking on some of the latest trends. And taking this even further, this great and very classical shotgun. And briefly touching on another example is the peripteral form where the columns surround the entire structure. On the left, you see a more typical early Louisiana example. On the right, a later example, which used double story Greek ansa pilasters. Much in the same way as Davis's Astor Hotel. Now, to end these examples, a personal favorite of mine, this tomb designed by James Dakin that pulls together so many of these ideas and influences. It's a small piece, but an important one. We have the proliferation of the ANSA capital as deep engaged pilasters made popular by Davis. We have a touch of the Egyptian influence that Davis's people, Dakin, picked up for a number of his commissions, such as his Bank of Louisville. From New York to Louisville, eventually down to New Orleans, Dakin designed that little arsenal with very similar qualities following the success of his bank. Combining all of these, he completed his design for the tomb with the battered walls, the central emphasis using the in ansis ansa pilasters, and at the very top, a little battered walled in ansis four-sided tempietto, very similar to his Bank of Louisville. With these examples, what I hope to show you is that the Grecian movement in the New Orleans region both modified and was modified by building types developed from a variety of sources under the influence of New Orleans-specific climate conditions and characteristic living ways. 
French, Spanish, African, American, German, Native American, and many other influences all contributed to the final result. Despite this variety in historical background, and despite the many political agencies, the Grecian movement proved its vitality and its adaptability by furnishing forms into which this combined inheritance could flow. It's a great example of how traditions can be updated and changed in a culturally respectful and regionally appropriate way. As in other parts of America, the best of the period's architects were interested not in creating Greek temples, but merely in finding out the best answers for the pressing building problems of the growing communities. Furthering along through the 19th century, the Grecian movement did lose its prominence as other styles appeared. Nonetheless, architects continued to find Greek architecture a useful resource for their designs. Here in Pittsburgh, the Ridgeway Library opened up in the 1870s. The courthouse in Hartford, Connecticut opened in 1929 with its use of the ante that became popular for this type of civic building. Just two blocks away from me is the Academy of Medicine here in Atlanta, built in 1941. And today, architects still find inspiration in Grecian forms and details. Here is a shot out of Stan Dixon's office, the firm that I'm at here in Atlanta, a great mountain house taking inspiration in the details of the portico, and the columns and railing off the back to frame the views of the mountains. And a home here in Atlanta on the left, and on another project, a fun newel post, looking at a Greek dork, but here with chamfered sides. This is just a sampling of some of the many firms recognizing the usefulness of the language in their residential work, both rural and more urban, and also in civic work, with the examples here being governmental and academic commissions. As we reach the end of the presentation, let's discuss some of the resources that I found useful during the design process that you can reference either for your own designs or just for further study. Now, just as then, to me, one of the most useful resources are the 19th century architectural pattern books. They are still an invaluable resource. Builders and designers will not only find inspiration from the plates themselves, but will still find the text to be filled with useful information on how to lay out stairs draw the profiles, and a lot more. There are a good number to reference, but these shown here are a few of my favorites. Some of these are available as inexpensive reprints that you can find on Amazon or eBay. Sometimes people ask, what are the differences between Lefebvre and Benjamin? There is, of course, a lot of overlap, but there are some differences you begin to notice. Benjamin's work is often on the stronger side and somewhat more simple, using the Doric more frequently than higher orders. He often uses flat bands and recesses that gave his work somewhat of a character similar to John Soane's work in England. Because of this simplicity, he's often referred to as more for the country builder versus the higher style architect. But with that, be careful to mistake simplicity for inferiority. Some of the best aspects of the Grecian movement, and those that many people connect with, is the simplicity and clarity in design, and what can be achieved with just a few carefully thought out molds and design moves. Nard's books, on the other hand, lean more towards the Ionic and Corinthian, and tend to be a little more complex. He uses a lot of rosettes and anthemion, and somewhat a contrast to these, often uses plain, wide bands to border door surrounds, mantles, etc. We've seen some of these um, in the interior at Milford and the Bank of Louisville that we saw earlier. I'd also recommend that you browse some of Peter Nicholson's books. While not necessarily geared specifically for an American audience, they were extremely influential and contain a number of inspiring plates. Lastly, I would also recommend that you look at more modern books by Carl Schmitt, such as Greek Revival Details and Greek Revival Architecture in the Rochester area, where he records details and molding profiles 
in really very useful ways. But if you are new to these resources, I would still highly recommend you start with these historic pattern books shown here to understand the specifics of what 19th century designers were referencing. You can also find digital copies online, such as on Google Books, or I personally prefer using the Hathi Trust, H-A-T-H-I Trust, which is what I have shown here with the beauties of modern architecture. The great thing is that you can download whole books or just a PDF of a single page that you would like to reference. You can also find copies of the Antiquities of Athens to reference Stuart Mervet's drawings directly or you can get a personal copy uh, from Amazon by the Princeton Architectural Press. Perhaps one of the most useful tools for studying precedent from a distance is the Historic American Building Survey. It's a collection of photographs and measured drawings of historic structures across the country. Just Google Historic American Building Survey and you'll find the Library of Congress link that will take you here. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent on this site, just going down a rabbit hole looking at buildings. So for example, this is the page for the Merchant's House Museum in New York, formerly the Seabury Treadwell House. On it, you'll find plans, elevations, photos, details, all sorts of things to reference as precedent, whether you're trying to find a molding profile, see how large a door casing is, whatever your goal. You can see here just some of the amount of detail you can find. To conclude, um, I'd like to end back on this little arsenal, a building that has always intrigued me and what it was able to accomplish in such a small, tight urban setting. I hope you all will find this information useful to you in the future. I love to discuss these things, so if you'd ever like to reach out, just reach me via email or Instagram, any questions, comments, or discussions. Thank you.